Hey guys, welcome back to the next lecture. In this one, we're going to talk about osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and ankylosing spondylitis. Let's dive in and let's get started. First up, we're going to talk osteoarthritis, also known as OA. This is the most common form of arthritis, and this occurs when the cushioning cartilage in the joints that helps to prevent the bones from directly rubbing against one another uh, when they move erodes away. Now, it shouldn't be a surprise that older individuals are more likely to suffer from OA because the cartilage as you age wears away with use over time. Now, injury to a specific joint can also increase the likelihood of a joint developing OA. Now, an important risk factor that you really want to keep in mind that's associated with this outside of advanced age is obesity, especially for the development of OA in the knee or the hip. And the reason is quite simple. Obese patients sustain higher loads on the joints, and that can wear away the cartilage faster than normal. Now, females are also more likely to suffer from OA. When it comes to the symptoms, remember that this condition is use-associated, so patients will typically feel worse after a long day of activity. This is as opposed to RA that can be worse first thing in the morning. Now, osteoarthritis, as I mentioned, is a progressive disease, but not all patients progress or remain in any stage of pain for a set amount of time. Typically, patients will initially develop sharp pain only with high-impact activities. This then progresses to near-constant pain with low-impact activities. And finally, they'll begin to develop constant pain that's mixed with occasional episodes of severe pain that limits their activities. Now, the joints most commonly involved in OA include the distal interphalangeal or DIP joints of the finger, the first CMC joints, the first MTP joints, the knees, hips, and the lower cervical and or lower lumbar spine facet joints. Other joints can be involved, though it is less common. So if this is seen, a more rigorous workup should be done to ensure that you're not missing some other type of diagnosis. Now, when it comes to the big symptoms of OA, we will likely see that the hands have hard bony enlargements. Uh, these are found on the posterior lateral side of the interphalangeal joints. These are, of course, known as Heberden nodes when they're located at the DIP joints and Bouchard nodes when located at the PIP joints. Now, over time, the joints can become deformed, and as time passes and the disease becomes more severe, patients can develop range of motion limitations with both active and passive movements in the joint. Now, palpations can produce tenderness at the joint line, and those with OA of the knee can feel knee instability. If synovial fluid is obtained uh, via arthrocentesis, the typical synovial fluid in OA has less than 2,000 white blood cells per millimeter cube and a mononuclear cell predominance. Synovial fluid is usually only going to be obtained in this patient if we suspect that there's another disease process. So for example, if you suspect crystal arthropathy, infection, or some other inflammatory condition, at that point, it would be good to, uh, to uh, get the synovial fluid. Otherwise, we don't necessarily need to. Ultimately, Remember that arthrocentesis isn't routinely performed on joints in those suspected of having OA. So if a vignette tells you that this test was done, it's a clue that you should probably steer clear of OA as your main uh, thought and look for something else. Imaging isn't typically ordered either unless another disorder is being ruled out. Now the findings on plain radiography in a patient with osteoarthritis includes joint space narrowing, the presence of osteophytes, and subchondral sclerosis. Many patients will have a completely normal radiograph, but still have OA, so these abnormal findings are not necessarily useful in making the diagnosis. Now, when it comes to diagnosing OA, it can be diagnosed clinically if the following criteria are met. Number one, the patient's 45 years of age or older. Number two, joint pain worsens following use. And morning stiffness lasts less than or equal to 30 minutes. Now, if the patient has symptoms that aren't typical of OA, such as having pain in joints not typically associated with OA, then further investigation with some lab work and imaging would be warranted. So labs to consider would be inflammatory markers like ESR or CRP, because these would be expected to be normal in a patient with OA. Imaging, I already discussed. Remember, sometimes no findings are present when the patient has OA, while other times you might see that joint space narrowing, osteophytes, or other signs. So just remember, the imaging is not routinely ob obtained in order to make your diagnosis. Now, when it comes to treatment, this is going to begin with non-pharmacological interventions, such as weight loss and exercise, and depending on the joint involved, we may use walking aids, knee braces, or even foot orthotics. Now, if these modalities fail to control symptoms, then as needed, pharmacological therapy would be used. Ideally, the patient could be treated with topical NSAIDs alone because of the better side effect profile, 
but this is often not going to be sufficient to control the pain, and patients will end up taking oral NSAIDs, which isn't ideal in elderly patients because there's increased risk of GI bleeding. Um, oral duloxetine can also be used in patients who cannot tolerate oral NSAIDs, and very rarely intraarticular glucocorticoid injections are used, but the pain relief here only lasts for uh, one month on average, and the steroids tend to degrade the cartilage and long-term may actually worsen the OA. Now, for those who fail all other options, surgical joint replacement of the knee or hip would be an option. All right, next up, we have rheumatoid arthritis, otherwise known as RA. Now, remember that while OA is mechanical in nature, RA is a systemic inflammatory autoimmune disease leading to joint pain and destruction. So risk factors for RA include having a family history of RA, being a female, as well as a history of cigarette use. Remember that where OA in, in OA, joint pain and stiffness was worse, worsened with use. In RA, you're usually going to see that it's worse first thing in the morning and uh, also with long periods of inactivity. So they wake up and it's really bad. They rest for a while, it gets really bad. So activity can tend to make it a little bit better. Now, with this condition, the joints can be painful, stiff, and swollen, and the joints will most likely involve the metacarpophalangeal as well as the proximal interphalangeal joints of the fingers, the interphalangeal joints of the thumb, and the toe metatarsophalangeal joints. Okay, so these, so keep these smaller joints in mind. They are usually the ones involved initially, and keep in mind that unlike in OA, the DIP joints are not typically involved in RA. Other larger joints can be involved. We can see that the wrists involved, the elbows, the shoulders, the ankles, the knees, and these can appear as monoarthritis rather than polyarthritis. Now, patients can also have some symptoms outside of joint pain. They may have myalgias. They may show weight loss, low-grade fever. They may have nodules, depression. They may even have episcleritis. The subcutaneous nodules are something you should particularly pay attention to because that is a huge clue if the patient has RA. Now, these nodules can be very small, often as small as a marble, all the way up to golf ball size. And these are usually located in the areas that experience mechanical pressure or are contacted frequently. So areas like the hands and the elbows are particularly frequent locations. Now, these lesions feel firm or doughy on palpation, and they're usually mobile and can sometimes form an attachment to subcutaneous tissues or tendons, and in that case, wouldn't be mobile. Now, the nodules can cause a variety of complications that arise as a result of compressing nearby tissues, nerves, or blood vessels. Now, what other signs and physical exam findings can we expect to see in a patient with RA? Well, the affected joints will be tender to palpation, swollen, and they may have restrictive passive and active range of motion. Now, while not always the case, bilateral findings may be seen in RA. And you want to watch for this condition, of course, affecting the MCP and the PIP joints in the hands. Now, fingers may also show what is known as ulnar drift, which occurs when the MCP joints become swollen and deformed, resulting in the fingers orienting towards the ulna. Swan neck deformities are also going to occur with hyperextension at the PIP joint and flexion of the DIP joint. You may also see boutonniere deformities, which are characterized by a deformed position of the finger, where the finger is flexed at the PIP and hyperextended at the distal interphalangeal DIP joint. Now, the most important biomarkers to check for in RA include, of course, rheumatoid factor and the anti-citrullinated peptide antibody, ACPA. These are usually tested for with an anti-CCP assay. Now, patients with these positive biomarkers will be considered to have seropositive RA. Aside from these biomarkers, the other labs that can be really helpful include measuring ESR and CRP, as these elevations tend to fluctuate with the degree of um, disease activity and severity. So a very active disease would be high in ESR and CRP, whereas a le less active case would most likely show these inflammatory markers to be closer to the normal range or even in the normal range. Patients with RA also frequently have some abnormalities on CBC, including thrombocytosis, anemia of chronic disease, iron deficiency anemia, and or mild leukocytosis. Now, in terms of synovial fluid, this is an inflammatory arthritis, so a leukocyte count of 1,500 to 25,000 white blood cells per millimeter cube could be expected with a polymorphonuclear predominance. When it comes to imaging and the RA patient, imaging isn't needed in order to make your diagnosis, but many times imaging will be used to support the diagnosis, especially if other conditions are being considered. So on plain radiography, periarticular osteopenia, erosions of cartilage and bone, joint space narrowing, and joint subluxation are all signs of RA. The diagnosis is ideally made when all the following conditions are met. 
First, a history and physical that is consistent with RA. The arthritis involves at least three or more joints. There's a positive rheumatoid factor and or ACPA. The disease state lasts six weeks or longer. You see an elevated CRP or ESR, and there's no evidence of any other disease. Now, when it comes to treatment, all patients should receive disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, with the initial drug of choice being methotrexate. Now, it takes some time for methotrexate to take effect. So during this time, the symptoms can be temporarily treated with NSAIDs or glucocorticoids to control symptoms. If after six months, the methotrexate alone isn't providing an adequate response, then either adding hydroxychloroquine or sulfasalazine or adding a TNF inhibitor is going to be warranted. Now, let's briefly touch on a syndrome that can arise in patients with RA known as Felty syndrome. Now, individuals with Felty syndrome will have a triad of manifestations that include RA, neutropenia, and splenomegaly. Now, the RA here is usually seropositive, so either RA, RF, or AS, ACPA is present, and there are severe joint and extra-articular manifestations of RA, as well as an elevated ESR and CRP, and it's usually not a subtle case here of RA. It's very, very obvious. Now, neutropenia would be picked up on a CBC with differential, and the absolute neutrophil count will be less than 2,000 per microliter. And due to this neutropenia, the patient might have a history of recurring skin and or respiratory tract bacterial infections. Now, aside from the positive biomarkers of rheumatoid factor or ACPA, patients with Felty syndrome are also more likely to have other positive biomarkers, such as ANA, anti-double-stranded DNA antibodies, ANCA, or even antihistone antibodies. All right, let's take a look at ankylosing spondylitis, AS, which is an inflammatory arthritic disease that tends to most commonly affect individuals who have human leukocyte antigen, HLA B27. So patients here can have a variety of presentations with this condition, but back pain is present in the vast majority of patients. Now the back pain usually begins before the age of 40, and some characteristics that set it apart from other musculoskeletal causes of back pain include that it worsens at night, uh, it doesn't improve with rest, and there's no history of traumatic incidents that preceded the pain. This pain is also typically insidious, with the patient really being unable to pinpoint exactly when they started having the pain. Now, aside from the back pain, patients can also have enthesitis, which is an inflammation at the site where tendons or ligaments insert into the bone. This is known to commonly occur in the heels. Patients can also have severe inflammation of the finger and toe joints. This is, call, this is called dactylitis. Now, this is sometimes referred to as sausage fingers due to the way they look. Hyperkyphosis, impaired spinal mobility, and hip and or buttock pain are also commonly seen. Now, conditions associated with ankylosing spondylitis include inflammatory valve disease, which will of course include either ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, and patients are also more likely to have psoriasis and or anterior uveitis. Now, when it comes to labs in AS, you typically might see elevations in serum IgA, ESR, CRP, as well as elevated alkaline phosphatase, which is of course linked to the bone pathology, not the liver. Patients may also have normal chromic, normocytic anemia. Now imaging findings associated with AS include pathology of the SI joint with joint space narrowing, sclerosis, and erosive changes, which are seen on plain radiography as irregular bony margins and bony ankylosis, which is stiffening and immobility of a joint as a result of fusion of the bones. Spinal findings include syndesmophytes, which are these bony growths that originate inside the ligament, ankylosis of the facet joints, and ultimately bamboo spine, which is total spinal fusion. Now, this is another disease where there are a lot of presentations, and you often won't get a neat picture of the disease state. So while individuals with the HLA B27 haplotype, chronic back pain, and sacroiliitis on imaging are a clear case for AS as your diagnosis, You'll often have patients that don't reach all the criteria, but still have the disease. Treatment here is going to involve NSAIDs for pain control, and then a TNF-alpha inhibitor, such as adalimumab, and if needed, an IL-17 inhibitor could be provided as well. All right, let's do some content review questions. Here's your first question. I'll put 20 seconds on the clock. If you need more time, hit that pause button, and then come on back. correct answer here is B. Next question. I'll put 20 seconds on the clock. If you need more time, hit that pause button. Once you got it figured out, come on back.
correct answer here is D. And your final question, I will put 20 seconds on the clock. If you need more time, hit that pause button. Once you got it figured out, come on back. Correct answer here is B. All right, that concludes this lecture. I will see you guys on the next one.